Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today we're going to talk about the nostalgia cycle loop. So this is something that I've talked about quite a bit on this channel. It's this idea of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, of Super Mario Bros, of all of these constant remakes and retellings and reinventions of stories that have already been told, driving our culture in a way that I think is ultimately pretty net harmful to how we proceed as a capital S society. I'm going to talk about that. This video will not be a final video. It'll be a part one, actually, because I think that I've been trying to tie a succinct bow onto most of the videos that I post on the channel, but honestly, <laughs> they need more than, than just one. But today I want to talk primarily about nostalgia, so this idea of the reinvention of the past, of always reminiscing on what could have been and what was. Alden left a comment on my last post in my newsletter, kyla.substack.com, that I thought was really incredible. So he wrote, your thoughts on the nostalgia cycle loop. Hope is the one virtue that requires imagination and the sense that we consider the past and imagine a better future. The nostalgic content being turned out via movies, books, even music requires less imagination on our part because it comes from already established world building. It's easier to imagine the context around a new Star Wars or Marvel sequel when we've already seen what a character looks like or know what Loki thinks of Thor. It's easy. I feel like it's easier to not go to the gym or out for a run. It's easier not to exercise our imaginations when given the option. And like all virtues, hope requires practice. We risk our ability to hope when we let our imaginative muscles atrophy. The inability to hope is a spiritual problem, but it can extend to a very visible economic reality too. In short, higher saturation of nostalgia, less imaginative capacity, reduced ability to hope, what's next? And there are essentially three threads within this. Hope requires imagination, and imagination requires work. Nostalgia encourages stagnancy, and we are in a culture cycle that encourages that stagnation. More nostalgia, less imagination, less hope, presumably sentiment dips, spending might get weird. People might throw all their cash into something called Dogecoin. <laughs> Nihilism becomes a forcing function for companies and investments, so on and so forth. And so that's sort of how I'm thinking about it, but I have this picture that for those listening on the podcast, you can go to the YouTube or the newsletter to see, but this it's this idea of you know imagination, perception, and hope really being the forcing function for how we proceed in the world, so nostalgia. Adam Mastriani, which I'm sorry if I'm butchering any words, I probably am, wrote a really excellent paper that I actually talked about last week on how people are just always feeling really bad. Derek Thompson summarized it really well. Our memory is biased towards positive information, so this nostalgia. Our present focused attention is biased towards negative information, so a threat. And our general perception is that everything is always getting worse. We remember the past better than it actually was. We treat the present moment far worse than it actually is. In a book called The Future of Nostalgia, which explores the future, the history of nostalgia, you know, study on longing and time, the author writes, the past has become much more unpredictable than the future. Nostalgia depends on this strange unpredictability. The ambivalent sentiment permeates 20th century pop culture, where technological advances and special effects are frequently used to recreate visions of the past, from the sinking Titanic to dying gladiators and extinct dinosaurs. Somehow technology didn't cur Somehow technology did not cure nostalgia, but exacerbated it. Nostalgia inevitably reappears as a defense mechanism in a time of accelerated rhythms of life and upheavals. Being reminiscent is reactive because we reinvent the past. The idea of the past being more unpredictable than the future is a nod to the reinvention of time that we often do in our own heads. And then we go and we remake it. We tend to look back fondly on those memories, on those moments, that might not warrant such warmth, I'm sure we've all done that before, but then we go on and remake those feelings with our technology and our movies and our music, we're always constantly revisiting that past. It's like when you have a breakup and you keep on thinking about your ex, even though you should just move on. You deserve better. And it's mostly because we are scared, we're scared to move on. It's all a defense, a way to protect ourselves from the overwhelming speed towards some eventual inevitability that we are experiencing. We are constantly seeking beyond what we currently have, but when we reach into the past instead of the future, that's when things can become problematic. We get caught in a loop, and when the stories that we tell as a capital S society are echoes of the graves from what once was, that is what is really problematic. So from this book, The Future of Nostalgia, again, culture is increasingly squeezed between the entertainment industry and religion. With the waning of the role of the arts and humanities, there are fewer and fewer venues for exploring nostalgia, which is compensated 
for with an overabundance of nostalgic ready maids. The problem with prefabricated nostalgia is that it does not help us to deal with the future. The nostalgia is a loop, requiring little to no imagination, as Kevin pointed out. It doesn't prepare us for the reality that we have to deal with. It's a form of forgetting, but it's also a form of escapism. Think of how many relatively uninspiring remakes and recycles there are of different TV shows. Book again. Native nostalgia reveals the fantasies of the age, and it is in those fantasies and potentialities that the future is born. One is nostalgic not for the past the way it was, but for the past the way it could have been. It is this past perfect that one strives to realize in the future. The stories that we tell on a broad scale are simply becoming less inspiring. They are simply iterations of the past the way that it could have been. We try to recreate this thematic through repetition, hoping that the past will become our future, but we just get stuck in a loop. Part of the reason for the nostalgia loop is economic uncertainty from both studios and consumers. It's because we feel like we're constantly running out of time, running out of money, running out of space to think. How could we ever think of the future when the only thing that feels really stable and concrete is the past? Kant once wrote that space is public and time is private. Now it seems the opposite is true. We might have more private space if we are lucky, but less and less time, and with it less patience for cultural differences in understanding time. Oppressed by multitasking and managerial efficiency, we live under perpetual time pressure. The disease of this millennium will be called chronophobia, or speedomania, and its treatment will be embarrassingly old-fashioned. Contemporary nostalgia is not so much about the past as the vanishing present. We are nostalgic because it is almost impossible to remain anchored to the moment of time that we are in. There is too much at every second, so in order to stabilize, we retreat to this familiarity, to this comfort, which ends up stagnating us and our culture. Then the question is, well, who defines culture, right? I read The Limits of the Billionaire's Imaginations Are Everyone's Problems by David Roth a few months ago, and I really have not been able to stop thinking about it. It's about the incuriosity, the sheer boringness of our billionaires and what they do with the resources that they command. He writes, it's not just about so few people having so much of everything, although that is plenty odious and offensive on its merits. The problem as it is experienced moment by moment and day by day is how little the billionaires have done with it and how little what they have done with it has done for everyone else. That inequality, when compounded over time and amplified by the cretinous and absolute joyless mediocrity of the people in whose accounts that compounding gets done, winds up not just freezing the world in place but shrinking it to the size of their own and curiosity. And this is only amplified by Zuck and Elon's cage fight. Like, you have so much money. Um, and yeah, it's kind of funny. Like, oh gosh, they're fighting in a cage. But it's also kind of annoying. Like, the most entertaining outcome is always going to be the most likely, as Elon says. But entertainment is cheap, and our culture is dictated by these algorithms. And the cage fight is just a stony reminder of boringness. And of course, this goes beyond just Elon and, and Zuck. You know, cage fight is kind of cool. Billionaires don't set culture, but they finance a large part of it. And what their money goes to hasn't meaningfully changed anything in a long time. They just follow herds and blow up bubbles and pump coins, and they're so reflective of this lack of curiosity, this lack of imagination, and this lack of hope. And money sets the tone, and billionaire boringness impacts the rest of humanity in really weird ways. And because that's weird and wealth concentration is weird, culture gets stuck. The algorithms that we are entrapped in are beautiful fountains of opportunity, but also a land of endless conflict and mind-numbing scrolling. Life After a Lifestyle by Toby Shoren explores the connection between culture and marketing and consumption and stories and consumerism and how they are all one and the same. He writes, Today, social media has become more perfect has become a more perfect tool for culture than Arnold could have imagined, and its use a science of penetrating the mass mind. All communication now approaches propaganda, and language itself has become somebody else's agenda. Little neutral ground remains outside of this economy economy. The main idea is that we have an economy where culture is made in service of brands. And to be even more literal, he's, he writes, cultural production has become a service industry to the supply chain. So we are stuck in a nostalgia loop because culture is branded by brands. The brands don't have a ton of imagination, although some do. And the financiers don't really have any imagination at all, although some do. And the stories that we tell on a large scale are just repetitions of things that we've already heard because that is the simplest and safest way to make a profit and also the surest way as a consumer to know that your time will be valuable. Valued. There's a lot to consider here, and uh, I'm ah. as Andy Clark wrote in the Experience Machine. Human minds are not elusive, ghostly inner things. They are seething, swirling oceans of prediction, continuously orchestrated by brain, body, and world. We should be careful what kinds of material, digital, and social worlds we build, because in building those worlds, we are building our own minds too. 
Our world is dictated by what we consume, what we look at really matters. And if that's the past, like if you're constantly talking about your ex, you're stuck there. As Morgan Housel wrote, a lot of times we're not interested in truth. And if that's the, uh, a lot of times we're not interested in truth. We're interested in the elimination of uncertainty and that fact alone causes us to believe things that have little relation to reality. The nostalgia cycle loop is important, and so is imagination, something that I'll talk about in the next video. If you have any thoughts on this, any comments that you would like to leave, please do. I think this should be a collaborative brainstorm sort of topic because it is so pertinent to the times that we all exist in, and it's so confusing, and we've never really been in the space that we've been in before. So if you have thoughts, comments, questions, please leave them below. Um, but yeah, this is a podcast. So let's appreciate it. It's also a newsletter, college.substack.com. I post almost every day on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube shorts. I'm on Twitter. I'm pretty much everywhere, I think, and I hope that you all are doing okay, and I will talk to you very soon.